what I thought I'd do today is tell, a little bit, tell you a little bit about the work that um, a few of us at Coursera and previously at Stanford have been doing on education. Um, I'm curious, how many of you have signed up for one of these uh, massive open online courses before? Wow, okay, that's a lot of you. Okay, good, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Um, because uh, uh, this event is co-hosted by the um, uh, Chinese Faculty and Families Club, um, what I did today was prepare a presentation with a much stronger international and especially Chinese slant. And so I'm actually gonna tell you about a bunch of things that we're doing at Coursera that relate to China specifically and some of the trends we see taking place in China. Um, um, and so there's a fair amount of material that I'm gonna share today that uh, um, I've actually never presented in the United States before. We'll see how this goes. So um, if you've seen MOOCs before, most of you already know that uh, Coursera today partners with top universities, including top schools in the US, um, top schools all around the world, um, as well as a few non-universities, uh, teacher professional development partners that teach teachers how to teach in order to create free online classes. Um, so uh, if you visit Coursera from the US, you can get courses from these, I think, 108 uh, university and other partners that have 500 and over 550 free online courses. And um, if you visit Coursera today from China, uh, this is what you see. And we are very much an international website. So if you visit Coursera from China, you know, we look like, in fact, we are a Chinese website. Um, so, and, and today with uh, over 6 million students and uh, uh, over 500 courses, Coursera is by far the largest MOOC or massive open online courses platform. So this is, since this is Stanford, I thought I'd share with you my story of how I guess all this had gotten started. Um, as a Stanford professor, I, I used to teach, in fact, I still do teach a on-campus computer science course on machine learning. And year after year, I was reaching about 400 students in my on-campus Stanford class. It was about two and a half years ago that I placed my class online and I reached an audience of 100,000 students. Um, so to put that number in context, for me to reach a comparable size audience, I would otherwise have had to teach at Stanford University for you know, 250 years. <laughs> and I think what, what uh, uh, my team had done was create a technology that enables one professor to teach not just 100 or 400 students at a time, but 100,000. And that dramatically changes the economics <coughs> of higher education. There is still a large upfront cost to creating the course once, but once you've created the course, the incremental cost of signing up one more student is nearly zero. And that's what allows us to do this um, previously crazy thing of taking courses from the best universities around the world and putting them online. Um, and I guess uh, in the last two and a half years, we've gone from one university to 108 partners, uh, two courses that my team had launched to over 550, and with six million students, uh, six million students. But by way of comparison, I think mean Stanford University have 20,000 students. Um, but with six million students, Coursera today is by far the largest um, MOOC, or massive open online education platform in the world. So since many of you have uh, signed up or seen the insides of MOOCs before, I'll be relatively brief in describing to you what the course experience or what the student experience is like of taking these classes. Like many others, most Coursera courses, uh, most, most of the courses that our university partners teach uses video-based instruction. So when you sign up for one of these classes, every week you might be responsible for watching, say, a couple hours of lecture videos um, broken down into five to 10 minute chunks. And over the last two years, um, we've seen the production quality of the videos slowly go up. Um, we used to shoot videos with, you know, like me and a webcam. That was, that was my first MOOC. And today, um, the online courses you find on Coursera often have very high production qualities, ranging from instructors doing field work to uh, various uh, interviews to, in the example, on the lower right-hand corner, there was a Wharton, UPenn Wharton professor, teaching a class on gamification. Uh, how to use ideas from computer games to improve, um, uh, to improve engagement of, of, of users. And perhaps appropriately, um, to teach gamification, he chose to show up for lecture one in his class in this persona as his World of Warcraft <laughs> character. So first day of class, instead of having the professor show up to teach you stuff, you see this you know, 
somewhat strange monster-like creature show up, and, and that monster-like creature starts talking in the professor's voice and starts to teach you about computer games. So I think there's a surprise uh, by, by the diversity and the creativity of um, that our instructors have been able to uh, use in, in, in the way they teach with video. Um, I want to highlight, just let you know about one feature of video-based instruction that makes this a particularly efficient way to develop, to, to convey content to students, and that is that um, we support accelerated playback of videos. Let me show you um, what that looks like. I'll play, show you an example of what a lecture video looks like, and uh, the first thing you see is the students speed up the video to uh, 1.5x speed. This is what that looks like. So a student just sped up the video to 1.5x speed. Um, English captioning, useful for non-native speakers, as well as foreign language captioning written by student volunteers. Um, so it turns out that one of the differences between teaching in an online class versus teaching in the classroom is that in, on a website, on an online class, often students prefer to blast through the material at accelerated playback uh, because it allows them to make more efficient use of their time, and if they miss something, they can just go back and do an instant replay. So uh, this is in contrast to a regular you know, Stanford classroom where instructors like me will tend to just slow things down and you know, blab and make space in order to make sure that students are following along because different students need different amounts of time, and if a student is lost halfway, they might be lost for the rest of the lecture. Um, so the accelerated playback and the, ins the ability of students to do instant replays allows students, I think, to make much more efficient use of their time. So kind of a personal story. Um, it was about, uh, what was it? It was about six months ago that I was visiting LinkedIn, you know, here in, uh, over in Mountain View. Um, there was a party at LinkedIn, and um, one of my MOOC students uh, came up to me, and he said, you know, oh, Professor Ng, I enjoyed your online uh, machine learning class, your MOOC, very much. Learned a lot about machine learning, taking skills using. And he said to me, he said, oh, Professor Ng, one of the things I most liked about the class was that I could speed up the videos and play everything, play everything at 2x speed, twice normal speed. <laughs> um, and, and if you miss something, if I miss something, just go back and do an instant replay. And he said, really enjoyed your class. But now that I have listened to 20 hours of lecture of you talking at 2x speed, he said, he said, now that I meet you in person, I'm really surprised that in person, you talk so slow. <laughs> <laughs> um, beyond the lectures, uh, most of our classes also have what we call in-video quizzes or in-video polls, so that rather than passively listening to a lecture, we often pop up poll questions or pop up quiz questions and let students do things and interact with the material. Because I think education isn't about what the professor does, it's even more so about what the student does. And by inviting students to interact, to answer poll questions and reflect on their own learning, uh, we think this is improving the quality of their learning as well. Um, and I think, you know, again, by, by, by way of contrast, in my Stanford class, uh, when I ask a question in my classroom, you know, only one student gets to attempt an answer, right? But on a website, um, video stops, a question pops up like this, and every student gets to attempt an answer. Every student gets feedback on the response they just submit to the website. Beyond the um, videos, most of our courses also have serious weekly homeworks ranging from short answer to math to uh, computer programming to um, uh, sophisticated auto grading. Uh, on the lower right hand corner is uh, auto grading and spreadsheets. We can have students build a financial model and upload a financial model to a website for a computer to grade this model that they built. Um, our philosophy uh, my, at, at Coursera has been that there's no way for a small team of us, we're about an 80 person organization right now, but there's no way for 80, the, the 80 of us to write all the software that enables instructors to express their pedagogical vision. So what we've done is develop a lot of programming interfaces, a lot of APIs that enables our university partners to plug in their software to enable our university partners to express their pedagogical vision. And over and over, um, I've been surprised, I've been over and over, I've been blown away by the richness of the experience that our university partners have developed to give to their students. In this example, 
um, Rice University teaches a computer programming course, and they developed a very sophisticated uh, software framework that lets students write computer programs right there in their web browser. And by the end of the class, students in this MOOC will have finished, will have implemented for themselves this uh, um, asteroids-like game, and students will have written for themselves a computer game where you know, the, the, the player flies around the spaceship and shoots down asteroids, as well as a few other games. Um, another example, this is uh, National Taiwan University, Taiwan Da Xue. Um, a, uh, actually a good friend there, Benson Ye, who's an instructor, decided to implement himself a computer game to encourage students to participate in the class. So Benson, um, um, let's chat with Benson this morning. Benson developed a computer game in which students um, play a board game and have to conquer other people's territories. And the way for you to defend your territory is to write quizzes. Um, there's a class on probability. So to defend your territory, you pose a question on you know, probability. It has to be a good question and you check that and so on. Um, and the way to attack other people's territories is by answering other people's quiz questions. Um, so he tells me that the effect of this game was that there were you know, thousands of students that really wanted to do well to conquer more territory. And the net effect of that was that he had massive numbers of students totally obsessed with solving probability questions. They're like solving questions day and night in order to defend their territory and, and, and attack other people's territories. <coughs> um, and other examples from uh, uh, online software to build chemical models to rich ways for students to interact with music. Our uh, app platform, our programming interfaces is I think uh, has been key to our strategy for allowing, for uh, helping our university partners express a very rich teaching vision for how, how they would like to teach. So, one of the nice things about the website is that um, you can grade a student's piece of work multiple times. At a university like Stan at, at Stanford University, when I assign the homework, usually a student gets one shot at it because we only have the teaching assistants to, to, to grade the homework once. And so if a student gets 60 out of 100, you know, they get back the graded homework and the class moves on with them only partially understanding that piece of material. One of the nice things about the website is that we have the resources uh, to grade a student's work as many times as they wish to submit it for auto-graded work. And in fact, um, what we've done is actually provide tools to instructors to make it easy for them to create randomized quizzes in which, in this example, an instructor poses a question with four right and four wrong answers. And each time the student comes to the website, um, the website automatically generates and shows them a different set of right and wrong answers. So I think that education shouldn't be as about assigning grading curves. Um, education shouldn't be about telling students, you know, you're a B student, you're an A student, that's a C student. I think that education should be about helping every student to succeed. And with auto-grading, we now have the resources to give every student multiple attempts at mastering a piece of material before the class moves on. Um, this is a teaching technique called mastery learning, allowing students multiple opportunities to master a piece of material. And perhaps no surprise, when our university partners and us have done studies, um, we could see that when a student gets multiple attempts, it allows them to have a more firm foundation to build on. And this causes them to do better on the next piece of material in the class as well. So um, our data from this uh, class taught by uh, EPFL, EPF Lausanne in Switzerland, is that um, if a student gets multiple attempts on homework four, let's say, um, they're having a, a three-point improvement in homework four because they made multiple attempts, translates on average into a one-point improvement on homework five. So it, it kind of validates this hypothesis that giving students a more firm foundation to build on allows them to do better, have a better shot at later pieces of work as well. So, so far I've just talked about um, computer graded work, but not everything can be computer graded. <coughs> I guess um, I learned an interesting lesson, was it? Uh, it's about a year and a half ago. Um, I think we just developed some of this randomization technology and I was visiting the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And I learned that if you walk into the office of a poetry professor, and if you show this poetry professor your, you know, 
shiny new like multiple choice auto grading technology. And if you try to convince a poetry professor to teach his class using only multiple choice, I learned that he will invite you to exit his office. <laughs> <laughs> so to enable instructors to offer more open-ended homeworks, uh, we put a lot of effort to develop a system for peer grading. The idea being that if you want to assign an essay, you know, ask students to write an essay critiquing a piece of poetry or describing an event in history or analyzing a business case um, or building a business model. If you have 100,000 submissions, then one professor can't grade 100,000 submissions, but what you can do is have the students grade each other's work. So this idea called peer grading has previously been uh, studied in small classes and been shown to give fairly accurate, to, to give highly accurate grades. What we also saw was, is it possible to take this idea of peer grading, previously done only in small classes of say 50 students, where you have 50 students and they grade each other's work, is it possible to take this idea of peer grading and apply it to these classes with not 50,000 students that all know each other, but with like 100,000 students that don't know each other, would that even work? So, um, um, spent quite a lot of time writing software uh, for peer grading, and so in this example, um, <coughs> uh, in this uh, in this example, um, in a class on teaching strategies, um, an assignment on teaching was assigned to teachers, and um, uh, uh, let's see, um, each uh, student in the class was asked to do a piece of work, and each student in the class was given guidelines for how to grade other students' work. And so we tried this out about a, actually about a year and uh, eight months ago, uh, uh, a year and, about a year and a half ago, in which we sat at these classes where students would write essays and five other students, total random strangers on the internet, chosen at random, would grade their work. And then we would you know, take an average of the five grades in the hope that this would be a reasonable grade for the student. Um, so does it work? Turns out that it does. Um, our university partners and us have both uh, have done multiple studies on the efficacy or accuracy of peer grading and we've shown that having five random strangers on the internet grade your work and take the average, if the website, if the system for doing so is well designed, this actually results in fairly accurate grades. Um, in fact, in certain cases, not all cases, but in certain classes, we believe that having five students grade your work actually results in more accurate grades or more consistent grading than even having one highly trained human TA grade the work. And, uh, and, and that's because um, having five people grade it and take the average um, actually averages out some of the random noise that happens when instructors or teaching assistants when there's only one person grading a piece of work. Oh, how do you motivate students to grade? Um, every student is required to grade other students' work. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and the deal is, you know, if you want five other people to grade your work, then you have to grade five other people's work as well. Um, so since launching the peer grading system, like uh, what, a uh, uh, year and eight months ago, a year and a half ago, um, again, as, as often happens, we're just repeatedly surprised by the richness of the um, experience that university partners can use our tools to give students. Um, these are actual homework submissions from actual students taking a design class taught by Wharton, uh, UPenn Wharton, um, in which students were asked to build a physical <coughs> artifact. Students were then asked to use their cell phone cameras to take a picture of the physical artifact that they had built and then to upload the picture for what they had built to be graded by other students. And um, over and over, we've just been repeatedly blown away by the creativity of the instructors in the assignments they can offer peer grading, as well as by the uh, creativity and the work of the students in, in, in the sorts of projects that they can now do work on and submit and get feedback on. Um, just one other example, uh, social psychology. Um, this is an interesting class. Scott Plows at um, Wesleyan, he usually teaches 12 students a year um, on social psychology. That was the size of his class, 12 students a year. He placed his class on Coursera and it reached 240,000 students. And 
um, for the last assignment of his class, he had a project called the Day of Compassion. And um, what he did was ask the students to spend a day reflecting on compassion or reflecting on what you can do to show compassion to others in your community, and then to write an essay describing what you did. And the winner, oh, and, and the best assignment, the winner as voted on by other students, will receive an invitation, all expenses paid trip uh, to United States, I think actually to Stanford, I'm not sure, uh, to visit, to, to, to meet to the uh, Dalai Lama. Um, the winner of this Day of Compassion um, Award, Day of Compassion Homework, was a student called um, Balesh Jindra, um, who is a physician that lives near New Delhi, where um, attacks, uh, sexual predation on young girls is a, often a problem. And what she did was she spent her day of compassion um, visiting schools and discussing this issue, this very difficult issue with young girls near New Delhi. And um, we believe that her work will um, be a major force to educate these young girls near New Delhi about what is and what isn't acceptable in terms of, um, uh, and to teach them to protect themselves from sexual predation. So these are the sorts of impact that um, giving tools to brilliant instructors such as Scott Plows can have on, I think, on our community and on our world. Um, talked a lot about the student experience, uh, talked about the lectures, talked about the homeworks. Um, the third and final, third component of student experience is the community. When you have 100,000 students in the class, a community built, gets built up around the material and students come together to discuss things with their classmates. So there's a strong sense that if you're taking these hard classes, you're not in it alone. Instead, you have you know, 99,999 classmates with whom to study and to work with. So I think this range of technologies, um, the, what, the lectures, the uh, auto grading, peer grading, discussion forums um, uh, have been key to enable us to offer a broad range of courses that span many different disciplines. <coughs> um, so let's see, Coursera today serves a very diverse international population. Uh, from the very early days, we had been around 35% US. Uh, the US representation is slowly trending down as, as really as the international representation slowly goes up. And um, uh, just to share with you, you know, a couple more stories of our students around the world. Um, uh, this is Amanda who lives in uh, uh, Dominica. She says, Coursera makes studying easier for me. I could sit at home and learn like I'm in school, no distractions, me and my headphones. I could earn certificates without spending a dime. Um, helps me a lot since my mom is in the hospital and financially I cannot afford to school. Or oh, Artie, um, devastated, left a job. I'll leave you to read this yourself. And I think by taking great courses and putting them online free for anyone to take, the impact um, on students is, is far larger uh, and affects so many students that none of us had ever dreamed we would be able to affect. Um, to paint a more concrete picture, I guess, of the demographics of uh, Coursera students today, um, it turns out that even though Coursera has started with university education, really has started from two Stanford classes, um, the biggest effect of Coursera today is not on college students, is not on 18 to 21 year old, instead is on continuing education. And the reason for that is that um, in today's world, in today's world, many of us go to school, go to college for four years, and then coast on our college education for the next 40 years. And in today's rapidly changing world, that makes no sense, and all of us need regular infusions of knowledge in order to stay current. And so, um, as working adults, many of us in this room, I guess not counting the Stanford students and the GSB students, but uh, working professionals like many of us uh, that are not in school don't have convenient access to continuing education. Um, even as a Stanford professor, it's challenging, it's, it's challenging for me to go sit at the back of you know, Philip's classroom, and it, it, it's just really awkward. Um, uh, <laughs> because, <laughs> 
Um, uh, uh, because yeah, and, and, and I think the effect we're seeing is that the convenience of an online class is bringing many working professionals back into the educational system. Um, <clears throat> and because of our uh, very international population, um, as Simi mentioned, we've also put a lot of effort into internationalizing our website. Uh, we did it first for Chinese and then um, uh, uh, are working on uh, uh, what Spanish, uh, uh, Italian, French, Russian, um, a few other major world languages right now. Um, and because of the very international nature of our uh, population, we're trying to internationalize the content of the courses as well. So today, Coursera has courses taught in English, meaning the professor is speaking English, as well as courses taught in Chinese, Italian, French, German, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, uh, you know, quite a few languages. Um, and so our university partner, Peking University, or Beijing Daxue, Peking University, teaches a number of fantastic courses where the instructor is speaking Chinese. Um, in addition to that, we're also taking courses taught by American professors speaking English and working with a number of um, translation partners to take American content and translate them into, uh, into other languages as well, uh, focusing on Chinese, Spanish, um, uh, sort of, uh, Russian. Um, and you know, one thing that I personally would like to see is that I think great teaching is to be found all over the world. By taking American content and translating it into Chinese, I hope that universities like Sanford can de deliver more of an education into, say, China. Um, on the flip side, I think that there are also many great universities in China and one thing I would love to see in the future is if um, American students, you know, English speakers uh, uh, like myself, can access content that was developed in Chinese so that we too can learn from the best Chinese universities or the best French universities. I know, happen to know there's a fantastic class uh, on convex optimization taught in French by Ecole Polytechnique, and I wish there were. And so over time, we hope to translate this content into English as well so that we can also learn from the best Chinese universities, the best French universities, um, the best Spanish universities. Since there's a Chinese audience, I thought I'd just mention, um, uh, I guess over the last, I, I, I have a, what, maybe a strong personal interest in China. I think visit uh, China like six times or something in the last year. And um, when I was visiting China, I learned that one of the biggest barrier to um, students in China having access to Coursera's and our university partners' content was just network bandwidth, network connections. Um, and so because of that, we um, spent a lot of time uh, what, coming to agreement with uh, NetEase, with Wang Yi, uh, one of the uh, uh, large internet sites in China, the operator of the largest free online education resource, uh, the largest um, open education portal in China. And so today, um, most Coursera videos uh, are hosted in China on NetEase, and we've been working with them to increase bandwidth and increase discoverability of our courses in China. Um, and finally, so this is no longer under mobile development. Um, and one other thing we realized was that in today's world, so much content is consumed on uh, mobile devices, and that if, frankly, today, if you don't have a mobile app, you know, there are large swaths of the audience you're really not reaching. And so about a month ago, we released our first iOS app. Um, and soon we will also, we also plan to release an Android app in the future um, to make our content much more accessible to students all around the world. One of the things that inspires me is that uh, today you can buy an inexpensive Android tablet for something like 20 US dollars. And uh, uh, we have not yet released an Android app, but we plan to. But what that means is that, you know, for 20, 20 US dollars, um, you can now give potentially anyone in the world um, access to the best Stanford classes, the, to the best Caltech classes, the best Princeton classes. And I, hope, I think that that will help us, um, that'll help us change the world. So, <coughs> um, right, since this is a GSB event as well, uh, free online courses, how do we keep Coursera sustainable? For philosophical reasons, um, I've really wanted the courses to be offered for free. Um, and, and so anyone can sign up, take a class, complete the class for free. Um, what we've done with uh, many of our university partners is offer a program called the Signature Track Program in which the course is free, but we charge a modest fee for what we call a verified certificate. Um, so the way it works is if a student signs up for, the, for a verified certificate, we charge a modest fee, maybe $50 or so. 
And um, every time they submit the homework, we do some work to verify that it really is you sitting at your keyboard submitting the, uh, submitting the homework. And I guess we use a combination of two uh, technologies for that. We, uh, first is um, we use your webcam, like your laptop webcam, to take a picture you know, with your permission to make sure it's you sitting at your keyboard. And second, this builds on the old research I did at Stanford. Um, it turns out that the way you type on your keyboard, like your typing rhythm, is fairly unique to you. It's, it's, it's like a fingerprint. Um, and so every time you submit a homework, we use a combination of your typing rhythm as well as taking a picture with your webcam to verify that it really is you sitting the keyboard submitting the homework. And uh, on that basis, um, the participating universities and us have been issuing verified certificates that students are um, uh, listing in their resume and that they're frequently using successfully to find better um, professional opportunities. Um, <clears throat> again, since this is a, a co-hosted with the GSB, I thought this would be a fun slide to show. Um, one of the things we found was that um, uh, having students pay you know, $50 uh, to participate in Signature Track is not just a um, revenue strategy for us, it's also a um, retention strategy. So overall, if a student signs up for a MOOC because enrolling is relatively easy, um, <clears throat> we find that if a student signs up for Signature Track, they are much more likely to complete the class and earn a certificate. Um, but that's no surprise. If you pay $50 for the right to earn a certificate, you're more likely to actually do the work and finish the class. But here's another interesting data point. Let's say that at the start of the class, we do a survey and ask students, do you intend to finish the class? How committed are you to finish the class? And now, let's focus on only those students that are highly committed to do the class. There are students that will swear up and down, oh yeah, I'll do every homework, I'll get it on time, I want to finish this class. So let's just focus on those students. It turns out that even among the highly committed students, um, the ones that are not on verified certificates, not on signature track program, have a certain rate of completion, slightly about 65%. But those that sign up to earn the verified certificate, even among this highly committed group, has a substantially higher, about 87% chance of finishing the class, having paid $50. Which just goes to show that um, you, when you have skin in the game, um, you are more likely to, to, to follow through and, and complete the class. Um, one trend we're seeing is that both students as well as employers are increasingly taking MOOC credentials seriously. Uh, the vast majority of students, um, over 76% of our students uh, participating in the Verified Citizens Program intend to list it in their resume. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of student motivations for taking these courses, um, uh, one of the students' largest motivations is to use uh, uh, the uh, credentials that they hope to earn from these classes in order to enhance the career, either to do better on the cur current career track or for a career pivot. Um, and <clears throat> in order to support students in their professional development, which is really where one of the places Coursera is doing very well now, um, one of the things we've done is start to work with universities to assemble not just single courses, but um, uh, to work with university partners to try to assemble sequences of courses. One of the most successful course sequences has been one offered by Wharton, uh, where they took four of the Wharton first year MBA courses and placed them online. And uh, this is one example of where our perception was that by taking a sequence of Wharton courses, um, this is one example where the whole is um, a more, vastly more, I think, than, than, than the sum of the parts. Um, and uh, by taking sequences of courses and earning sequences of credentials to list in their resume, um, employers are increasingly taking these credentials seriously. And uh, uh, anecdotally, we're trying to get hard numbers, but anecdotally, this is opening the doors to many students to improved employment opportunities. <clears throat> so, um, as a machine learning, as a data scientist person, one of the things that excites me about teaching these online courses is the data that you can get and the learnings that this enables. When I present at different venues, um, I tell different stories about what we're doing with the data. Let me share with you just one, one story. 
Um, so it turns out that if every week, if every week we send you an email that says, dear student, friendly reminder, homework is due this Saturday. If we send you that email, you're less likely to finish the class. You're less likely to engage with the class than if we didn't email you at all. <laughs> but on the flip side, if we were to send you an email that says, dear student, we noticed you logged into the website last week. Good job on that, check mark. Oh, and we noticed you watched five videos. Good job on that too, check mark. Oh, and you got submitted the last homework on time and you got full miles. Great job on that, check mark. We noticed also you made a comment that was very helpful to other students. Good job on that too, check mark. <laughs> oh, and by the way, the next homework is due on Saturday. If we send that email, you're much more likely to finish the class. <laughs> so perhaps it's no surprise that if we remind you of the things you've done well before we ask you to take the next step, that you're much more likely to engage in the class. Um, but the way we discovered this was not by insight. The way we discovered this was that um, one of my engineers had all these designs for different emails with different types of content, and he said, Let's just send tens of thousands of these different types of emails to tens of thousands of students, and we just look at what the students do, and we'll see what type of email increases completion and what type of email decreases completion. Um, and it was by looking at the data, then we went back and actually kind of read the emails that the guy wrote and uh, figured out, you know, <coughs> after the fact, that this was the email that was more effective and that, and, uh, compared, to, compared to the other. And so this is a sort of lesson that we were able to learn only because we had tens of thousands of students that we could send emails to randomly. Um, if teaching, you know, if you're teaching 100 students, you just cannot send enough variations of emails in order to get this sort of data. So <coughs> um, at Stanford, <coughs> I guess my 400 student Stanford class has grown to what, 720 or 760 students. So I think last quarter I taught Stanford University's largest on-campus class. Um, but as Stanford faculty, the feedback we get from our courses is once per year, we get you know, like a course evaluation like this. Um, and that's the feedback we get once per year. And so I feel like for the you know, decade plus that I've taught at Stanford, I got feedback once per year and so once per year, I get an opportunity to improve my class. And this is an incredibly slow rate of, of, of learning for me, right, for my ability to improve my class. Um, on the website, we log every mouse click, every keystroke, every homework submission, correct or incorrect. Um, and the data that we can get from second to second, or from millisecond to millisecond, is giving us rich sources of information to feed back to instructors that allows instructors much more rapidly to improve their classes. And so when an instructor has a question like, should I put my face in the lower right-hand corner of the video? Um, I don't know the answer to that. We had huge debates, actually, in the computer science department, when we're launching the first few MOOCs, we had huge debates about, is the instructor's face just distracting, because you know, it's moving around randomly, or does it <laughs> help the student form an emotional connection? I mean, what is better? We, there were about equal sized cams on both ends, and you won't believe how long we debated this. Um, but on Coursera, you can just get the data and find out. Uh, put 20,000 students in each group and run what's called an A-B test. Um, we did that. Um, so what's the answer? Uh, the answer is, we still don't know. Um, or rather, um, the students in group B complained vehemently that they were really bored um, and so, and they really wanted to see the instructor. And so we, we canceled that experiment, but I guess that actually told us in this case that having the instructor's face is more, more efficient. And these are the experiments that our instructors, our engineers routinely run. Uh, today there are, um, I would guess, high dozens of A-B tests running on Coursera right now, most of which I don't even know about. Uh, and our rapid speed of running tests, getting feedback is allowing us to improve learning at a rate that um, I personally had never before experienced when I was teaching a standard <laughs> class once per year. Um, and because of that too, we put a lot of effort into developing instructor interfaces to take the data from the classes and feed information about their classes back to the instructors so that they can get these signals. Um, and this has been a major investment for us to make the data 
to make the raw data available to the universities if they choose to analyze it, as well as to take the results of our analyses, our instructor interfaces, and feed this information all back to the, um, to the, uh, 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 to, to the instructors. Um, yeah. And, and you know, I guess maybe kind of funny, since, the GSV, since, since Philip mentioned the, the cat thing, in, in, in my former life, um, uh, I ran a team out of Google that uh, built one of Google's largest machine learning systems. Um, uh, so if today, if any of you use an Android cell phone, speech recognition on every Android cell phone in the United, actually in the world, except for China, uh, runs on top of software that, that my team at Google had built. Um, but one of the things I learned there was also, if you think about um, uh, you know, advertising, Right. Why, why are certain types of ads, why are display ads, brand advertising less valuable? Um, it's just because if I show you, you know, like a Gucci brand and you don't click on it, I don't get information back. And so you can't optimize the ad. So the ability to feed information back to you so that you can optimize something makes that much more valuable. Um, this is the ability, your ability to get data to let you optimize makes something much more valuable. And we hope to do that with education. Um, Maybe just to finish up, uh, one, one last piece, since this is Stanford, you know, over the last, what, two years, um, uh, I've often been asked if anyone can go online and take, you know, free Stanford classes, uh, why on earth would anyone still, right, travel to the United States and come to Stanford to, to earn a Stanford degree? And I think the answer is that the real value of a Stanford education isn't just the content. Uh, content is increasingly free on the web anyway frankly, whether we like it or not. And I think, um, in my opinion, the reason students come to the great universities, Stanford, Princeton, Caltech, um, or, or, or Peking University, or Fudan University, or Shanghai Delta University, students come to our great campuses not just for the content, but for the interactions of the professors and the interactions with other equally bright students. So I like this quote by Plutarch that uh, the mind is not a vessel that needs filling, but wood that needs igniting. And I think our role as instructors is not to fill um, minds. I think it is to ignite minds. So many of our university partners um, are now implementing what's called the flipped classroom <coughs> mode of instruction, in which by putting the lecture content on Coursera, they can send their students um, onto the website to watch the videos on the website. And what this does is it preserves the classroom time um, for the instructor to deliver higher value for the instructor to move up the value chain and to deliver higher value services, such as real mentoring, coaching, to work with students on research. Um, for a university perspective, one other fascinating um, use of MOOCs has been that um, at most universities, we have a teaching mission as well as a research mission, and both are incredibly important to our universities. The impact on the teaching mission, I think, is clear through use of the flipped classroom to improve the quality of on-campus teaching. Um, what we're starting to see is an impact on our university's research mission as well. So if a student joins the Stanford Computer Science Department and wants to work with me, say, on research, often they have to wait a year until my machine learning class is offered again, then take two and a half months to take the class, and then after that, you know, after like maybe 50 weeks or something, they have acquired the knowledge they need in order to be productive in doing research in my group. But now that I have so much more content online, what I can do, what I do do, is send Stanford students to take a two-week intensive period to learn as much as they can, to learn everything I need them to know about machine learning. And so after two weeks, um, we can now get new Stanford, I've been able to get new Stanford students to be productive in research rather than you know, like a 50-week cycle until the right class comes along and they take a class and so on. And so I think that, especially as content becomes more modular, um, having online content will be able to allow great universities to enhance not just their teaching mission, but also their research mission by um, allowing us to much more efficiently give our students, undergrad and grad students, the skills they need in order to engage with, uh, uh, with research in our communities. Um, also that. So just to wrap up, um, you know, here's something that I'd like to see happen in, 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 a, in, a, in a year or two. I hope that um, in a year, I hope that there'll be a lower income individual, maybe a checkout clerk working for Safeway. I um, hope that there will be a lower income individual, maybe right here in California, or maybe in the developing economy, um, 
who I hope that there'll be such a person, they'll sign up to take a dozen Coursera MOOCs. Um, they have to work really hard to finish these courses, but I hope that that person will list the courses on the resume and use it to find a better job and earn a livelihood for themselves and their family. Because if we can offer that to the Safeway checkout clerk that wants a better life for their family, or to a struggling uh, uh, adult in India who's earned a degree that does not offer him realistic employment opportunities, if we can use technology at scale to offer such a person a shot at a better life, what that means is that we can use technology at scale to give everyone a shot at the middle class. And I think this country needs it. Um, I think other countries probably need it even more. But I think that if we can give everyone on this planet a shot to the middle class, I think we can dramatically enhance the progress of a civilization um, and give so many more people and their families um, a vastly improved life. And with that, let me say thank you very much.